Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I hope you all can hear and see us. If you could let us know, we'd appreciate it. My name is Andrew Dalton. I'm the executive director of the Adams County Historical Society here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And I'm here with my good friend, Tim Smith, who is our historian. Um, and tonight we're going to be uh, presenting a project, a, a topic related to an ongoing project that we've been working on over the past few months. And it's related to our new facility that you may be familiar with. Uh, we are building a new home for the Adams County Historical Society starting later this year. It'll be a large museum, archives, and education center. There's actually a rendering of it just behind me over my shoulder. And if you haven't had a chance to check out our website and learn more about the project, uh, you can check out www.achs-pa.org. We'll post that in the comments as well later. So tonight we're going to be talking about one of the, f the first topics that will be addressed in this new museum. It'll be about nine or ten sections of chronological history. We're going to take visitors through from the earliest days of inhabitants and even before that, uh, which is our topic tonight, through the Eisenhower era and even beyond into modern times, with of course a heavy emphasis on our community and what our community endured during some of these incredible events like the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln's Address, the World World Wars, and before that, before the Civil War, you know, the French and Indian War, the American Revolution. It'll be an American history museum of sorts that, that tells the story from the perspective of the incredible people who lived here in Adams County and in Gettysburg. Um, it's also, uh, tonight I should say, is part of a, a series we're going to be doing. Every month we're going to do a new topic related to one of the different galleries that'll be in our new museum. Uh, tonight we're talking about prehistory, so we're starting uh, billions of years ago, literally, with some of the artifacts in our collection, which Tim will get to in a, in a few moments. Um, the series is going to be called 300 Years of History. So uh, even though we're well before 300 years tonight, um, over the next few months, for the rest of the year, we're going to be talking about a different period of time and some of the stories that are associated with that era, and as well as some of the artifacts in our collection. Now, why do we need a new home? Uh, we are currently in a very old Victorian house here in Gettysburg, and a lot of our collection is, is boxed up in storage crates out at a warehouse. Uh, so literally millions of historic items are in jeopardy. We have no fire protection, no climate control, and we actually haven't accessed a lot of these artifacts in about a decade now, I believe. Uh, they've been in storage for a very long time. Um, and so this new home will allow us to put those back on display for you, to present all kinds of educational programs, um, and to have an open research archive where you can come in and learn about the Civil War, about Adams County, about Gettysburg, and so much more. And we are very excited uh, to say we're far along in our capital campaign, but we still need a lot of help to get across the finish line. So if you have a chance to hit the donate button tonight on this post, we would really appreciate it. Uh, it's safe and secure, and every little bit helps. And we also have a $500 match for tonight's program from one of our very generous volunteers at the Historical Society. Um, so for every dollar, um, it'll be matched up to 500, and uh, um, it's extremely helpful to have that kind of wonderful support from all of you and for our, our, from our very generous uh, volunteer who's, who's put up that match for tonight. So if you can, hit the donate button at some point during the program tonight. We really appreciate it. It helps us continue to put these programs on for you every week. Um, I also want to thank the Alexander Dobbin House, the Dobbin House Tavern, um, our sponsor for in the entire program series in 2021. Uh, we're very fortunate to have our friends at the Dobbin House supporting us. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and he'll talk about this really fascinating early history that many of you may be familiar with bits and pieces of, but we're going to present several topics that we find really compelling, including the geology of Gettysburg, the rock formations you may know, some maybe you don't know. We're going to talk about dinosaurs. There were dinosaurs in Adams County millions of years ago. We're going to talk about what these prehistoric creatures were doing here and what they looked like and what they ate and you know how we've actually come to learn more about them. Um, and we're going to talk also about a meteorite that was discovered here in Adams County in the 1880s and the incredible story of its discovery and how it ended up in a museum in Austria, believe it or not. So uh, let me bring up our presentation here and I'll turn things over to Tim. And uh, let me just make sure we've got that all set to go. All right, there you go, Tim. Go ahead. So, you know, a couple things. This area of the museum that we're going to be talking about is kind of a, you know, it's a relatively a small aspect of our museum, but it encompasses a large amount of Adams County history. And basically, in the first section, we're talking about uh, Adams County prior to human habitation. And uh, I should preface this by saying that we are not geologists. We are not paleontologists. 
we are historians. And we sort of look at this topic from the historical perspective. Um, also, you know, uh, the museum is going to have a heavy slant on Adams County during the American Civil War. And we understand that a lot of people coming to our area that want to visit a museum are going to be interested in how this area is affected by the battle. And I've always looked at that as not a hindrance to our teaching our local history, but as an advantage. Because we can draw people from the outside into our local story by presenting the battle, and then we can give them aspects of our local history on top of it. So one thing that I think we've tried to do in the early sections in the museum and then the later sections of the museum is tie the battle sort of as a watershed mark into our story as we go along. And uh, I think you'll see that we, we're, you know, we're striving to do that. Now, geologically, uh, of course, Adams County is one of uh, 67 counties in Pennsylvania. And uh, the area uh, that uh, we're talking about uh, is about 522 square miles, give or take. And, you know, uh, for the purposes of display, Adams County fits really nice into a rectangular map. Uh, this map we're looking at is actually a map that was... Uh, formulated or designed in 1876 by the Pennsylvania Geological Survey. Wow. And it's kind of a, a geological map of the area. Right. Uh, and basically you can see on the map that, uh, you know, the western part of Adams County is the South Mountain region. And the uh, central and eastern part of the county is part of what we refer to as the Gettysburg Plain. And uh, let's... You know, of course, there's, uh, you know, streams in Adams County. And I always think it's interesting that the streams in the eastern section and the northern section of our county uh, actually flow into the Susquehanna River. And then, of course, down into the Chesapeake Bay. And the streams in the central and western part of our county, uh, for the most part, flow southward into the Monocacy and into the Potomac River, which all eventually flow into um, the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. Right. And Antietam Creek as well. It's something I think a lot of people don't realize. Yeah, you know, not shown on this particular map is Antietam Creek, which actually starts in the South Mountain Range and on the western boundary of Adams and Franklin County. And that actually runs into... Um, through Washington County, Maryland, and into the uh, Potomac River itself. Now, one interesting thing, uh, aspect of our county is the South Mountain Range to the west and northwest of the county. The South Mountain Range has always provided uh, protection to the people who lived here, whether it be early Native Americans or early settlers. Uh, through the time period of the French and Indian War into the Civil War. It's a natural barrier. And uh, uh, we are fortunate that from the years 1875 until 1885, the Pennsylvania Geological Survey did a massive mapping project of the South Mountain Range. And uh, somewhere in our first gallery, we're thinking about featuring the South Mountain Range. And uh, this is uh, the, ma the map was actually published in several sections. I think it's like eight or ten sections, depending, depending on which ones you want to count, uh, along the uh, Adams, Franklin, Cumberland border. And uh, here I've actually taken two of the sections closest to the Maryland line and spliced them together to give you an idea of what we're talking about. And prior to this survey, we did not have a true elevation of our area run uh, from the Atlantic Ocean. So for those familiar with the Warren map of the battlefield, which was surveyed in 1868, 1869, you might notice that Big Round Top has the ominous height of 666 feet. But when they actually ran the survey, they discovered that Big Round Top is actually 785 feet above sea level. 
And so this survey, published in 1885, actually gives you an accurate um, assessment of the height of the different uh, hills in, that make up the South Mountain Range. So uh, if you have the Warren map, and you have a map based on that, you'll notice that the heights are 120 feet off of the actual heights. Wow. Now, also on this map, I should point out that um, one of the interesting things is, uh, you know, the pass that runs through the South Mountain uh, from Fairfield over towards Waynesboro. We refer to it as the Monterey Pass because, uh, you know, it's named after the 1846 uh, Mexican War battle. And there was a very popular Monterey Hotel. And I, I think here I put it on the map. Uh, uh, the Monterey Hotel itself is actually in Franklin County, but this is one of the few maps that actually shows Adams County and Franklin County on the same map. Less than 20 years after the battle, it gives an accurate um, picture of the retreat route of the Southern Army um, following the Battle of Gettysburg. So here's an instance where we have an artifact that's uh, geological, uh, and ge geographical in nature, but it actually can be used by historians to understand a little bit about the American Civil War. And, and Tim, the South Mountain, that's kind of the only real mountain range or, or serious yeah. range of, of, of hills through Adams County, right, that you can Yeah, and you know, the South Mountain Range runs from the Potomac River up towards Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. I think it covers right. something like 70 miles, right. and it passes along the western part of the county. Right. We do have other hills, uh, smaller hills, uh, to the eastern part of the county, like the Pigeon Hills. And of course, there are three projections that you might know uh, in the county, like for instance, uh, Jack's Mountain, um, Big Round Top, uh, in Little Round Top, obviously, right. and Round Hill. And these aren't glacial, right? No. And uh, for the most part, um, we're, we'll talk about that in a moment. Great. But on this particular map, I've highlighted uh, the Monterey House and the Monterey Pass that runs from Franklin uh, northeastward into Adams County. And we do have in our collection uh, photographs, and here's a colorized postcard from the Monterey House looking through the Monterey Pass towards uh, Fairfield and the open uh, Gettysburg Plain. This today is predominantly wooded, and you don't have the same view that you have in this postcard. Wow. It's wonderful. And in our collection, while we were conducting uh, research to try to figure out what we might talk about with the South Mountain Range, I figured we'd highlight uh, Thaddeus Stevens, Caledonia Furnace, and uh, maybe um, the early efforts to put a railroad uh, in western Adams County. But we actually have something that Franklin County historians might be interested in. We have an 1880s um, illustration of the Monterey House, the Monterey Springs Hotel. And uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty fascinating, and I don't recall that I've ever seen it. So, How um, long was this hotel in operation? Do I think know? the hotel, um, and, I, and, I, and I have it here in my notes, I could actually look. I think it was established um, in the 1850s, and of course it's named after the 1846 sure. right. um, uh, battle. Right. Let's see, right. I probably have it right here somewhere. Um, uh, I don't. I don't have it in my notes when it actually uh, came about, but it was in, it, in the 1850s. It was very popular. It was a summer resort, and by the time of the battle, uh, it was pretty much as you see in that picture. But that's an 1880s illustration of it, right. and the view from the Monterey House northeastward towards Gettysburg was something to behold. In 1867. A visitor who was here in Gettysburg learning about the battle traveled out to the Monterey House and he said, just below the Monterey House on the summit of South Mountain, the view to the flatlands extending towards the Susquehanna as far as the eye can reach is magnificent in the extreme. I have seen few views in Italy which exceed it in romantic beauty. So that's a J. Watts de Peister. 
in 1867. Wow, that's wonderful. A couple, I just want to address a couple comments sure. also. Thank you to all that have donated. Oh my gosh, Melissa and Bruce and Connie. Connie, our good friend in Florida. Greg, Sue, Kevin, Kim, Michael. It's just amazing. We so appreciate it. And Lisa as well. Um, and I just wanted to address a couple comments. So somebody asked, what, a, what is the tapeworm reference on the map that, that we just had up on the, on the oh, screen? Oh, that's interesting. They saw that. Uh, the tapeworm railroad is the early effort to put a railroad in this area of Pennsylvania, leading from the industry along the Susquehanna River out across York and Adams County and then south to the C&O Canal and the emerging B&O Railroad. Uh, it was sponsored by Thaddeus Stevens. Sometimes it's called the Thaddeus Stevens Railroad or the Pennsylvania Railroad is the official name. But because of its circuitous, circuitous route and the fact that it ate up taxpayers' money, <laughs> it became known as the Tapeworm Railroad. In 1839, the project was canceled. And from 1839 until the 1880s, when they finally established another railroad on the similar route, um, this unfinished railroad existed in western Adams County. Right. That's wonderful. Um, another question, we'll get to this actually probably in, ne in next month's program. Someone's asking about the famous Native, Native American battle near Devil's Yeah, we're Den. actually going to talk about that, but yeah. not in this particular program. We will, yeah, Native Americans will be our next topic uh, next month. Um, and another comment about the Susquehanna River originating in Cooperstown, New York, which is true. I, I Excellent. Like that. We're I, several times <laughs> I have been to the actual spot yep. on the lake yep. that entered, you know, in Cooperstown right. that, where the Susquehanna River yeah. is. Wonderful. Um, in 1879, I, I was able to find an article in uh, the Gettysburg newspaper, and I guess it's from, um, what did I put on here? Um, Looks like Gettysburg Compiler. Yeah, it's in, a, in 1879, the compiler. And it actually is an interview, sort of, with the man in charge of the survey that led to that large map we were talking, to, talking about. And I only showed a, sh a small panel of that map. But... They actually give the elevations of some of the more prominent hills in wow. the South Mountain Range. And, uh, and again, this is based on the same elevations we use today instead of the prior elevations. And the highest point in Adams County on the South Mountain Range is along Big Pine Flat Ridge. <laughs> and it's 2,100 feet in elevation. That's the highest point wow. in um, Adams County. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure some of you have been along big flats <laughs> on the Shippensburg Road over right. the mountain, and it's very close right. to the spot. Somebody's asking about the mountain range. Uh, how far south did glaciers actually reach? Because they did reach into oh, Pennsylvania. Oh, so right? the, the glacial activity in Pennsylvania uh, must have uh, stopped, um, you know, a good... Uh, uh, 50 to 75 miles north right. of uh, where we are at today. Wow. So, um, and we'll talk uh, about the development of these rock formations and mountains in a, yeah. in a few slides. I, I believe, it's right? often, here's what I, well, you know, we're going to get to it, but often I've been asked as a battlefield tour guide about Devil's Den being in, uh, formed in the Ice Age. And I used to say something like, well, you know, the last Ice Age was 10,000 years ago, and these rocks were formed 200 million years ago. <laughs> so people who say the rocks were formed by the Ice Age right. are 199 million 990 wow. years off. <laughs> and there's other theories about where those rocks came from, right? Yeah, What's your, yeah. your favorite, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get to we'll that. We'll get to that's that, a, yes. That's good to know. <laughs> now, good. Uh, you know, geology and mineralogy... Uh, is an important subject, and I think an our museum will we'll pay uh, a small homage to it, and we'll talk about um, you know how that affects our local settlers. And I, I have a slide here, and this is from uh, the Adams County Historical Society's museum uh, that was here from the 1960s until we redesigned it in the early 1990s. And this was a closet that had uh, uh, samples of rocks and minerals from different portions of Adams County in it. And I think I got a right. couple close-ups here. This was in here. Schmucker Hall. So we were in, located in Schmucker Hall from the early 60s until 2011 when we yeah. uh, boxed up a large portion of our collections uh, and, and moved to the, the smaller Wolf House here. Yeah, that's a wonderful photograph. Yeah. One thing I like about the images that were in our uh uh, Schmucker Hall, and this is after we moved them to a different location in uh, the 1990s. But in this view, you can see that it tells you 
where, uh, it doesn't say on that one, but it tells you where in Adams County a lot of these samples came from. And this is diabase, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Diabase is the rock that Devil's Den is made of. Um, uh, copper, and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that early on in Adams County, uh, people were using the materials that they found in the area uh, for business, uh, for building, for economy, and they used them to better their lives. There were copper mines in Adams County along the South Mountain Range. There were uh, furnaces where iron was made into products that could be used. And let's go to the next one. Uh, Native Americans used rhyolite along the South Mountain Range to form spears for hunting right. and axes for construction and building. Right. Um, and local people used the rocks in the area, specifically the diabase found around Devil's Den, as construction material in the early buildings. I'm sure you've seen stone buildings around Adams County. Now, not all of them are made of diabase, they're made of other stones, but um, the stones were used in the construction of buildings. And diabase was cut up into blocks and used for cellars and for the bases of buildings. Even though we have brick buildings around town, if you look at the base of the brick buildings, like the courthouse, for instance, the diabase rocks uh, on Powers Hill uh, which was owned by Solomon Powers, were used in the construction of the foundation of the courthouse. Wow. So materials, uh, geological in nature, were used uh, by local people. And as a matter of fact, the granite that was used became so popular, uh, it was used in other places. In this article mentions in Philadelphia, they're using some of Gettysburg's uh, granite, and they, they even call it. Gettysburg granite. Wow. But I should tell you that it's not granite. It's <laughs> diabase. And more specifically, we refer to it as York Haven diabase. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But, um, um, you know, uh, it's a little confusing because the locals called it Gettysburg granite. Right. But um, don't take the rocks for granite. <laughs> I like. want to thank uh, Tim and Steve and all the others who've donated. We really appreciated it. Helps us so much as we're preparing to build a new home and, and put all this material that we're talking about tonight into some really wonderful, engaging exhibits where you can see some amazing artifacts mm -hmm. from our collection. Now, I should mention, uh, uh, if we go back just to one... To, uh, Whoops, we'll get there. Okay. <laughs> there um, that the York Haven Diabase in our area is part of a larger formation called the Gettysburg Cell which basically runs from the center of the county northeastward through the county. It's about a mile wide, and you know it runs from near Emmitsburg up towards Carlisle, and there is a, uh, several spurs of it out towards uh, York Haven. And uh, uh, wherever you go, this is an intrusion of igneous rock that came up through Trias Triassic uh, sand uh, and shales in the area. And as a softer and... Um, softer soils continue to erode away over time, more and more of these uh, diabase rocks are exposed right. and they become these uh, popular rock formations in our area. And this, uh, this explains too why some parts of the battlefield are very rocky and others are not. Right? Yes, you and see you, you look, only you see, it's you in the see the dark part of the red uh, line in our geological map and you can see where right. the York Haven diabase right. exists. Now, good does this action. mean, Tim, that there's buried rock still, you know, way deep yeah. down under? So, the, so you know. it's, 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 you know, globs of hardened molten magma, and it's under the Earth's surface. Wow. And there was a crack formed in the Earth's surface when the forces were at work that created the South Mountain Range. Wow. And on this map, uh, which is mostly just south of Gettysburg, you can, you can see the intrusion wow. of a uh, diabase rock that runs through the middle of our battlefield. Right. And so that explains why there are diabase rocks at Devil's Den and Little Round Top and Culp's right. Hill, but they're not out in the fields of Pickett's Charge or on Seminary Ridge. Right. That's a different kind of rocks. Of course, the most famous rock formation in uh, our area uh, locally is Devil's Den. 
and it's basically this intrusion uh, of igneous rock that we have. And uh, Devil's Den, uh, of course, because of its uh, interesting nature, has received a lot of attention over the years. And um, we should point out, you wrote a book on Devil's Den as well. If yes. folks are interested, they can yeah. find that, I think, on Amazon and maybe on our website. <laughs> now, when I wrote the book on Devil's Den, and I happen to have one yes. here. Oh, there it is right there. Um, I, 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 you know, I did as much research as I could on the geology, but the uh, Pennsylvania Geological Survey, which is made up of a, a huge amount of wonderful people, they have done a lot more research in recent years. And uh, the York Haven Diabase is said to approximate from 201.2 million years ago. Wow. And, um, uh, you know, Devil's Den to us, I think we're all familiar with the name, but uh, there's a lot of legend and lore about why it might be called Devil's Den. And uh, in our museum, I think we're just going to highlight... Uh, Sally Myers 1913 letter when she writes as a child I have heard talk of snakes which infested the country <laughs> and had their den among those huge rocks parties of men were organized to rid the neighborhood of these dangerous <laughs> reptiles one big snake persistently eluded them they could never kill or capture him and they called him the devil do we so, believe this the story? Oh, of course. <laughs> so to Gettysburgers, that has always been the devil's, devil's den. den. That's great. I like when she says Gettysburgers, because I thought we were Gettysburgians. Right? Yeah. Maybe we I thought not. the Gettysburger <laughs> was something that they sold at the blue and gray. <laughs> so okay. these rocks, when they go out there, we're literally millions of years old. There's, yeah. That's amazing. And of course they erode with time. Let's sure. go to the next one. Now, there are other formations in the area, and we thought maybe for fun in the museum we would have, like, some other rock formations. And, you know, I envision people taking copies of them with their cell phone and going out and trying to locate these formations. <laughs> but this one is the Devil's Kitchen. Let's go to the next one. This is the Devil's Slipper. And these are, are these names that came about after the Civil these War? These are historic names. Yeah. And we argue about when right. these places actually got their names. Right, right. Yep, I see but, some people are liking it. You know, I don't want to give too much away because <laughs> they might have to find them. Some of our people watching have been to the Devil's Kitchen. Yes. The Sphinx. This one's hard to find. Yeah. And, and this one is quite a walk on the back side of Little Round Top. And you can see what happens is you have these formations, and the erosion has caused these formations to appear as they do today. Now, what's the craziest theory you've heard before we go any further about Well, there's a lot of <laughs> people have theories about them, but the theories aren't based on scientific yes. evidence normally. <laughs> They're based on uh, uh, fiction or speculation. Uh, Emmanuel Bushman, a local Gettysburg resident, was convinced that Devil's Den was a huge pyramid of rocks that was built by the ancient Aztecs. And a cannon or something or an uh, uh, explosion took place and blew the rocks all over the wow. place. And that's why they're everywhere, because they flew so far. Right. And it, you can see Devil's Den, and you can see that if you put all the rocks together, it would feel, form a pyramid. Wow. I mean, but this happens all the time. I mean, just... Uh, Maybe 15 years ago, a supposed geologist from New Jersey came with a whole thing about the curious rock formation. And we're going to get to that next, about how this was man-made, like right. Stonehenge. And, you know, looking at it, it does look like Stonehenge. But again, I have lots of friends that are geologists at the Pennsylvania Geological Survey. And uh, one of them, let's go to the next one, drew this map. And basically, they explain how... All these rock formations wow. were at one time underneath the earth. And what happens is they break apart because of, uh, you know, chemicals and, you know, erosion. And then as the ground and the soils and sediments erode away over time, the rocks are exposed. And then as a rock is exposed, it comes to lean on the one below it and so on and so forth until you get these oddly shaped balancing rocks. Wow. The curious rock formation, if we go back one, is on the slopes of Little Round Top. Wow. And I, I think it's interesting how uh, 
one of the geologists actually drew his diagram based upon that particular photograph, and that's why I put the two together so you could see that. So it's, you know, the rock formations on the battlefield are a result of erosion. I think one of the more popular questions we get as battlefield tour guides were, is, were the rocks here during the battle? <laughs> Or did the Confederates bring the rocks with yeah. them? Right? I can't imagine when you, if you're thinking about that, what, how you think the rocks got there if you don't think they were here naturally. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Wow. Now, the other thing about Devil's Den that we enjoy and will probably include in our museum at some point, whether it be near the beginning or near the end, is that people have always had a natural curiosity of the rocks of Devil's Den. So... Um, Early on, there were picnics we have evidence of around the rocks of Devil's Den uh, prior to the battle. Uh, people were carving their name in the rocks of Devil's Den prior to the battle. And then after the battle, because of the natural uh, you know, scenery of the area, not to mention the carnage that, occur that occurred there on the battlefield, people started getting their photographs in front of the rocks of Devil's Den. Uh, in 1880s, a, a cameraman, William Tipton, actually put up a uh, you know, started taking people's photographs in front of the rocks on a regular basis. We have hundreds, if not a couple thousand, images in our collection of people in front of the rocks of Devil's Den. Here's the Carlisle Indian School in front of Devil's Den. Uh, prior to that, we had uh, veterans at Devil's Den. Uh, normal visitors would get their photograph in the rocks of Devil's Den. Wow. Uh, there's a, a local family, Samuel Reck, who was a Civil War veteran, and his family. Um, here's people had their Sunday best on. They had images of the brand new automobile. Here is Eddie Plank, uh, the Philadelphia Athletics uh, baseball player, with his coach Connie Mack and others in a 1914 Oakland. I think it's interesting wow. <laughs> that he would, you know, that Philadelphia. Kansas City, Oakland, <laughs> they'd become the Oakland A's. Uh, that, right. You know, that's, that's uh, I'm sure they knew that when they bought the car. Wow. But here in 1913, he had a 1914 model. That's I've always been confused about that with cars. Yes, if you're a famous baseball player, right? You can, you can get the car ahead <laughs> of time. Wow. Um, uh, but people, we have literally thousands of these hundreds or thousands of these images. And the local images. citizens visited these rock formations before the battle, right? There was, there was they, already... People were visiting before the battle, and right. of course they just became more and more popular afterwards. And there so, are carvings in the rocks too, right? Yeah. At Devil's Den. Yep. What's the oldest carving that we know about um, the battlefield? Well, the oldest carvings at Devil's Den have been scratched out right. by chiselers, but uh, there was an 1830s inscription mentioned in several wow. early accounts. That's amazing. So in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, it became very popular. Right. Um, I, you know, I just put ones in here that I thought uh, people might be interested in or, sure. that are, you know, um, kind of nice. Now, the next topic, of course, we want to talk about in our museum is something that's actually probably the oldest artifact that we have here in our collection. Uh -huh. And how old would you say it is? Well, I think our estimates are a couple billion at least. <laughs> It's hard to, to know for sure, but it is undoubtedly the oldest artifact here in the collection. So it is the Mount Joy meteorite. And what we can go back to it. Sure. Um, wow. So let me, this let is me a see. photograph I should point out, and we just took recently um, of, of the, it's a, just a small section of the Mount Joy meteorite, which was a very large object and Tim yeah. will give the exact dimensions and measurements of it uh, but it is an amazing story it was discovered I think Tim might have the whole story but it was discovered in the 1880s in a farm near two taverns about 10 maybe 10 miles mm -hmm. south of Gettysburg by the farmer Jacob Snyder Tim do you have a, a quote there you, you want to yep, read? Yep I do. Okay wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway um, you know we're going to have some exhibit panels for the museum so you know I have some of these exhibit panels of ideas of what we want to say but again, nothing is written in stone. So if you want to change the geology section, you can always write in and do that. Right, and we appreciate you joining us tonight, too. If you have comments or suggestions or things that you really found interesting, please let us know, and we'll make sure to highlight those things. You know, we want to make mm -hmm. this museum process as collaborative as we can. So on November 16th, 1887, Jacob Snyder was planting an apple tree near his farmhouse in Mount Joy Township. Just below the surface, his shovel hit an unusual metal object. It resembled 
a large oyster shell, two feet long, one foot thick, and it weighed 847 pounds. Wow. Uh, he actually talked about it to his neighbors. Uh, eventually, a local school teacher, I think his name was Calvin Rudisill, actually came to his house and said, that is a meteorite. In 1891, um, Snyder uh, consulted with the Smithsonian Institution, and they offered to buy it. But he turned it down. Uh, their bid was a little low, and he ended up selling it to a guy named Edwin Howe for $650. And that drawing, you might see, is by uh, Edwin Howe. Um, he was a mineral dealer from Washington, D.C., Recognizing its significance, he cut it up into at least 40 specimens, and they were um, sold all over the country to scientific repositories. Uh, the largest mass, weighing some 380 pounds, was sold to the Museum of Natural History in Vienna, Austria, where it can still be seen today. Wow. And we'll get to the next one. At the time yes. of its discovery... The specimen was said to be the largest meteorite ever discovered east of the Mississippi River. And it's the third largest meteorite ever found in the United States at the time of its discovery. I don't know about, you know, now. Um, this is a photograph of um, a guy named uh, Lee Shadel a 1937 graduate of Gettysburg College who undoubtedly was very good friends with Dr. Charles Gladfelter here at the Adams County Historical Society. And on a trip to Vienna, Austria in October <laughs> of 1975, he had his photograph taken with the 300, wow. and what did I say, 380, um, is that what I said? 380 pound segment of the meteorite. Keep in mind, Originally, it was 847 pounds. Wow. So there are chunks of it. In if you places. get on the internet and you Google it and look around, right. most of the museums in the United States that focus on right. meteorites have a portion wow. of it. That's amazing. The meteorite is 93% iron, about 5% uh, nickel, and has some cobalt, copper, phosphorus, and sulfur that it's made up of. Wow. Now, um, we're not sure when the meteorite hit or how it came to be here. But there is a long record of meteor showers in this area during human habitation and recorded history. Probably the most famous, if we go to the next one. Sure. Yep. We'll get it in a second. Um, <laughs> is the night of the falling stars. Wow. Um. Upon the meteorite's discovery and its notoriety, older citizens were quick to connect the mysterious object with an event referred to as a night of the falling stars. During the early morning hours of November 13th, 1833, a meteor shower took place all along the eastern seaboard of the United States. With limited scientific knowledge, <laughs> one can only imagine the reaction of the local population to this unprecedented event. Right. This is an actual uh, illustration out of a copy of the Gettysburg Star and Banner that we have wow. from 1833. And I really like at the bottom, what's it say? Um, for the gratification of those who were not witnesses. <laughs> they actually show you Pretty accurate, what a eh? meteor is <laughs> extremely accurate. Yes. According to J. <laughs> Howard Wirt, that lived in Mount Township as a, a youth, Scenes most ludicrous ensued in a thousand localities. Men returning from midnight carousals and debaucheries <laughs> fell on their knees by the roadside and prayed for the first time in their lives. Others urged their steeds to frantic speed as if Satan was close in pursuit <laughs> and about to foreclose the mortgage upon their souls. Wow. I, I, I just can't imagine... Right. You know, a, a meteor shower. Sure, with no of real explanation of what that would have been. Yeah. yeah. Now, again, we're not sure right. that this meteor came from that particular shower. It could shower. have been in the ground for thousands of years. It could have been know. in the ground yeah. for millions of years, right. yes. Yeah, absolutely. But um, yeah. It, it definitely is a spectacular yeah. find. Sure. And we're fortunate 
in our museum to have a chunk of the Mount Droy meteorite on loan from the National Museum of Vienna, Austria. Wow, yeah, and we're excited to display that as well. So um, a, a donation will help us put that chunk of meteorite on display for everybody to see. Perhaps <laughs> if we get enough donations tonight, we can buy the rest of the meteorite from the <laughs> I don't know about Museum that. of Vienna, Austria. <laughs> yes, um, Gary, our good friend Gary Edelman must be watching. He said, dressed up Tim rocks. <laughs> a nice new suit Tim's got on tonight. Very good. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that, I think that concludes the second of the three main topics we were going to talk mm -hmm. about tonight. Mm -hmm. The third we saved, I think, the best for last. We, we love talking about our, our Gettysburg dinosaurs. So, and we're also, if any kids are watching, we're still not sure what we want to name this dinosaur that we're about to tell you about. So as you're watching, if you have any ideas, if anybody's watching, has their kids or grandkids around, help us name the, the Gettysburg dinosaur that we're going to yeah, tell I, you about. Yeah, I think, I think that's a valid thing here. You know, uh, you know, sometimes I get in my way and, you know, sometimes I come up with things and I name things. But honestly, I don't really know what I'd like to uh, call the dinosaur here that we're talking about. So... This is the story of the dinosaur footprints. So basically, on July 27th, 1937, unusual marks were discovered in a slab of stone at Trussell's Quarry in Adams County. State geologists and paleontologists examined the finds and discovered over 40 footprints made by three different prehistoric animals. Wow. The slabs of greenish-gray shale have been dated to the Triassic period, roughly 215 to 220 million years ago. As the fossils gained notoriety, the slabs were distributed to museums and private collections, including the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., the Carnegie Institute in Pittsburgh, where they have them on prominent display, and the Pennsylvania State Museum, in Harrisburg. All right. Let's get to the we'll next one. We'll show you some pictures. This is Trossel's Quarry, which we'll talk about in a moment. Oh, we'll go to the next one. Oh, there, there you go. go. So, the man who first noticed the footprints was Elmer Hale Jr. And, you know, I got to say here that in the Bloom History of Adams County, which was published in 1992, his name is misspelled as Elmer Haight. And perhaps because of that, when I was first researching this story in the 1990s, I was unable to find any information about him. And I regret to say that his name is Elmer Hale and not Haight, and he died in 2008. Ugh. I could have spoken mm. to the man who discovered the footprints if I would have known. Wow. He was an engineer working for the United States Department of Agriculture. He and other workmen were at the quarry near York Springs because they were involved in road improvements and bridge building at the Gettysburg National Military Park. As a result, a few of the footprints were eventually placed on a bridge near South Confederate Avenue near Big Round Top where they can still be seen. But in our collection, we have some of the most dramatic examples of the footprints. And here is an image of um, Hale, Elmer Hale, at the site of the quarry, uh, you know, and they're highlighting one of the footprints. Let's go to the next one. Um, so this is one of the footprints in our collection. And if anybody's seen the ones on the um, South Confederate Avenue Bridge, you'll notice ours are much more distinct. Uh, in August of 1937, the Harrisburg Patriot did a whole spread in their Sunday newspaper on the discovery of the dinosaur footprints. And again, there were three different prehistoric animals discovered. Not just one dinosaur, but uh, two dinosaurs and a, um, a large um, uh, reptile that was not a dinosaur. And no bones were found. Is that right, Tim? Um, no bones were found there. And I just checked with the state paleontologist the other day on this, and this was something I had learned. No dinosaur bones have ever been discovered in the state of Pennsylvania. Huh. 
And a, again, it, some of it has to do with the fact that we don't have the right type of, of uh, geological yeah. formations to find dinosaurs. They're still, right. um, you know, enthusiastic about the possibility of finding them. Now, not far away in Haddonfield, New Jersey, of course, that's, that's where Hedrosaurus folky comes from. Wow. So a fa very famous dinosaur. But we are talking about footprints. Right. There are no dinosaur f bones associated with these footprints. One interesting thing, the same types of footprints have been discovered in England and in Europe. Wow. Because at that time in the Triassic, there was all just one continent called Pangaea. And of course, over time, uh, with continental drift, you know, and the, the continents separated. So this animal is widely known uh, from footprints here and in Europe. And of course, in Europe, they have uh, bones uh, right. from these early yeah. dinosaurs. We've got a lot of names, by the way, coming in for Excellent. the dinosaur. We'll have to read them all at the end here. <laughs> now, again, there are three different kinds of animals. And, and when you look at some of the literature about these finds early on, what you'll notice is names are given to the footprints. The names given to the footprints are trace fossil names. And these names are not the names of an actual dinosaur. They're names for the footprint. The dinosaur footprints, most likely the ones that we have, belong to an early sauropodomorph. Very similar, but much smaller than the popular Platyosaurus. This is a small herbivore dinosaur which walked primarily on its hind legs and was perhaps four, maybe six feet long. Years ago, the named old tulip foot <laughs> had been given to describe our particular dinosaur, and that term has remained very popular in uh, local writings. So sometimes you might look and find an article where it talks about old tulip, tulip uh, foot. <laughs> I can't even say it. But um, I, I was looking for a name like Sue the Sauropodomorph. Yeah, we may, we may need, uh, so we're getting a lot of names. We, if we had some S names, that might be good too. We've got uh, Getty, Getty Zilla. Getty Zilla, I, like I that. love that I, one. I knew you'd like that one. Berm for Bermudian Creek, I like that. Very good. Um, we have, uh, let's see, there's a, a couple others. I wanted to mention that in this particular drawing, and Andrew, can you want to give a, an oh, idea on. of that pronunciation we'll in we'll that particular drawing? There we here? go, just a second. Here we go. Oh, okay. Now we're, now we've got it. <laughs> um, if you look at the bottom of it, this, I think, what do they call this? They, Padocosaurus? Pa Padocosaurus <laughs> or something like that? So again, this is not a name of a dinosaur. <laughs> it's a name associated with a particular type of trackway. And again, sometimes you see it called Anchiosaurus. And again, that's a name associated with a trackway, not associated with a particular dinosaur. But the, the, skin, the really skin, skinny, thin version of the dinosaur there is probably more what it looked like. The other uh, uh, view we showed a few seconds ago of a sort of uh, oh. A sauropodomorpha, Platyosaurus. He's kind of heavy, and I kind of think this one's a little smaller and a little uh, skinnier. Um, but let's go to the next one. Now, this is uh, again, as Andrew mentioned, our museum artifacts have been in storage uh, since we moved in uh, like 2011. Yeah. So I have not seen or touched our exhibit since then. But I did put this exhibit together. Um, uh, from the old museum into a newer version of our museum in uh, the 1990s. So, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with the footprints. And you can see there is one of our slabs with just an incredible version of the footprint on it. Wow. And that's, again, from our uh, sort of pot of right. We want to display this, too, uh, so that kids can come up and actually touch yeah. the, the footprint and put their hand in it and feel what it was, uh, yeah. what it was I like. I don't think we're worried <laughs> that somebody's going to touch them so much all road away. So right. I think we're going to make it so that kids can touch them. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. That's great. Good. There it and, is. And uh, this is from the South uh, Confederate Avenue bridge on the Gettysburg Battlefield. Wow. And you can see uh, this is a, if, if you say ours is concave. This is a convex uh, version of uh, one of the footprints. And you can see ours is uh, illuminated much better. Ours stands out a lot much, much better than this version of it. 
Wow. Let's go to the next one. And then here's another one on another slab of stone. So there are two different slabs of stone that have these uh, dinosaur footprints on right. them uh, on South Confederate Avenue on the battlefield. And I know if tour guides have kids on a tour, uh, they often stop here and uh, point out the dinosaur footprints in the bridge. Right. And how did they preserve this well, Tim? I mean, how we know just a little bit about it, I think, when we've researched this recently. You know, what I read, I think mm -hmm. we found out is, you know, the, the footprints would fill up with little pebbles and other materials, and then they were kind of covered yeah. over by, by new uh, rock as things hardened. And, yeah, did, did we put know, that in here? So maybe we, we did. We may have. It's amazing they've remained so well preserved so, over you know, the years. So, you know, the rocks of Trossel's Quarry represent a cross-section of millions of years of Earth's history, from the late Triassic to the early Jurassic. So we're talking about... Um, you know, from the bottom le uh, levels being like 220 million years ago to the top of Trossel's Quarry is about 190 million years ago. Wow. The strata where the dinosaur footprints were found, known as the Gettysburg Formation, consists of greenish-gray, thick-bedded shales and sandstones. When dinosaurs walked through the mud, they left footprints. Over time, these footprints were filled with soil and sediments. And after hardened into rock, they were preserved for millions of years before being quarried in the 1930s. Wow. So that's a simple explanation right. uh, of what we're, what we're talking about. Have you been to the about. site, Tim? And uh, let's go to the next yeah. one. All right. So in the 1990s, I said, I wonder where Trosa's Quarry is. We have a photograph of it. Uh, in the early newspaper articles, they described how to get there. So I looked on some tax property maps. I figured out who owned the area. I called the owner. I got permission. And uh, Randy Miller uh, of the Historical Society and I went to the site. Uh, we lined up the photographs. It was pretty far uh, back off of the road along uh, Bermudian Creek. Uh, we climbed up the side of the hill. I had a um, uh, you know, rock chisel with me. <laughs> I chiseled some rocks open, and while I was there, let's go to the next one. I actually found a fossil in a rock. Wow. Um, I'm not sure what the fossil is. <laughs> I'm hoping that, uh, you know, um, when our museum uh, artifacts return and we start preparing for the museum, may I get the state paleontologist to visit? He, I'm sure he wants to see our dinosaur footprints anyway, because they have samples of the same uh, footprints. Uh, and, and like I say, there, there were altogether about 40 different tracks. And uh, today, these tracks, different people have uh, pieces of these uh, footprint trails. But uh, maybe he can tell me uh, what, you know, exactly wow. I found. Wow, that's amazing. I wonder if how many more there are out there that we haven't. Now, you know, obviously, I went to Trosa's Quarry, climbed up to the top of the quarry, and was looking to see if I could figure out what level they may have found the dinosaur footprints in. But I think, you know, here's how it works. If we were to remove the houses from the top of the hill along, um, I don't know what that is, um, uh, Latimer Valley Road, maybe we'll take like five houses down. <laughs> and get some bulldozers and scrape away the topsoil and then chisel down through the beds of rock to the right level, we would find more dinosaur footprints. Wouldn't it be worth it? Wow. Wow. So That's we could amazing. do that. It could be like a $30 million project, and we could get a couple more dinosaur footprints from the ground. <laughs> Well, we one day maybe <laughs> we'll yeah. have to do this project first. But uh, yeah, yeah we, we ha I have actually never seen the dinosaur footprints um, because they've been in storage for a decade. That's so fascinating. We are excited to get those out and yeah. show people. We think kids will love it, and, and we can talk about this early history. It's amazing. You know, we're able to do some science, some geology, some mineralogy, some um, you know prehistoric uh, yeah. research to to put this, these stories out in the museum. But um, we're really excited. This will be, of course, a small component of our museum. We don't want you to. I think the, the whole museum is going to be about rocks and dinosaurs, but we wanted to take you through uh, from the very beginning, um, through the entire gallery, over 300 years of history. Uh, this is probably the largest period of time we'll be talking about in any of these programs. We've covered millions of years in just about an hour, um, but we are so excited to be able to put this all together for you at our new facility, which will be located just north of Gettysburg, um, near the Gettysburg College athletic fields. Um, It'll be so the last building on the north 
south side of town. That's great. There you go. Yep, and we're going to start construction actually in just a couple months here. So we really need your help to, to make this project successful. If you have a chance to hit the donate button or visit our website, it's achs-pa.org. You can see more building renderings. We've got a video from, from Ken Burns talking about the importance of the project. And uh, we'd really love to have you with us.